Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing adjoining an element to a ring. Okay, so in this next video what we want to do is develop our intuition a little bit further for why this formal way of uh, adjoining an element onto a ring which is going to obey a certain polynomial relationship uh, actually does what we want it to intuitively do. Okay, now we're going to first do this in the context of a field rather than a general ring. And that's because uh, the theory is considerably easier in the context of a field rather than a general ring. It becomes more complicated in the concept, in the context rather of a general ring. Okay, so what we're going to be doing then is we're going to be taking a polynomial ring here uh, over the field capital F and we're going to be uh, quotienting out by the principal ideal generated by some polynomial P of X here. Okay, and what I want to do is characterize what this structure is actually going to look like. I, I'd like to write out an is equal to and then write out what this set is actually going to look like. I'd like to find representatives for all of the cosets here. Okay, so let's say that we have some polynomial p of x here, and I'll write this out explicitly, so it'll be p0 plus p1x plus all the way up to pnx to the n. So the degree of our polynomial p of x here is going to be n. Okay, and we are now quotienting out our polynomial ring here by the principal ideal generated by this polynomial. Now my claim is that this as a set is going to look like all polynomials of this form, r0 plus r1x plus all the way up to rn minus 1, x to the n minus 1. Okay, where the Ri's are elements of the field capital F. Okay, and these polynomials are going to be the representatives of each coset, basically. Okay, so I'll put a bar over it. So my claim is that when we partition up the polynomial ring here up into the cosets of this principal ideal generated by P of X, we can represent each one of the cosets by a polynomial that has degree uh, strictly less than the degree of this polynomial here, so strictly less than N. Okay, and that all of these polynomials here represent a different coset. Okay, so my claim is that this is the set of cosets here, okay, and that uh, we will add these in the normal way that you would add polynomials, so we would add the components here. So you take a representative, of course, from uh, the coset, and you'd presumably take uh, the most obvious representative, which is the one we've named the entire coset after. You take a coset from the other one, so you take a representative from the other coset and add their um, coefficients component-wise uh, to get the answer in terms of addition, and then for multiplication you multiply them in the normal way that you multiply polynomials using distributivity, you'd get something over uh, which is bigger, has degree bigger than n potentially, and then you'd work out which coset it was in and reduce it back uh, to uh, just talking about representatives uh, which have degree strictly less than n. Okay, so what I want to do then is explain why this is the case, why any polynomial in my ring of polynomials over the field capital F is always in a coset with a polynomial that has degree uh, less than n. Okay, so how can I show this? Right, so understand what have we done when we did this. When we quotiented out the ring of polynomials by the principal ideal generated by P of X, we effectively said that this polynomial here was equal to zero. Now the instant you do that, you can rearrange this and get something else. You can get an equation for x to the power of n here. So what I can do is I can rearrange it like so. I can say that this implies that x to the power of n here is the multiplicative inverse of pn, and that will exist because we're working in a field and we assume that this is not equal to zero in the field, so it will have a multiplicative inverse. Okay, and then it will be negative p0 plus negative p1x plus all the way along to negative pn minus 1 x to the n minus 1. So the instant you say that this polynomial is going to be equivalent to 0, you also instantly imply that this polynomial x to the n is going to be in the same coset as this polynomial here, i.e. they're going to be equivalent to one another. Okay, so this one will be in the same coset as this one is what's implied by uh, this being in the same coset as this. 
Okay, right. Now, what this allows us to do is take any polynomial, so let's say we've got an arbitrary polynomial, AX, which could be absolutely massive. Okay, so we could have some arbitrary polynomial in uh, the ring of polynomials over the field, so I'll just stress that AX is going to be an element of the ring of polynomials over the field, capital F here, F adjoin X. Okay, so here comes our polynomial A of X. And this will be a0 plus a1x plus all the way along to am, let's say, x to the m. And I want to stress m could be absolutely enormous here, much bigger than n. Okay, and now what we can do is I claim we can say that this is going to be in the same coset as some polynomial of degree less than n. So some polynomial which the maximum degree of it can, it can possibly be is n minus 1 here. And the reason is that I now have this expression. This is equivalent to this. So what I can now do is for all powers of x that are greater than or equal to n, I can substitute in x to the n here is equal to this thing. So for instance, if I take this monomial here, a m x to the m, what I can do is rewrite this as a m x to the m minus n, and I'm assuming here that m is greater than or equal to n. Okay, so the assumption is that m is greater than or equal to n. If it's not greater than or equal to n, then of course you've already got a polynomial that is degree uh, less than n, so you don't need to bother. Okay, but if it's got degree greater than or equal to n, then you can factor out an x to the n, so you'll get a m x to the m minus n, and then you can replace the x to the n with 1 over p n um, Whoops, and then we'll have negative p0 plus negative p1x plus all the way along to negative pn minus 1, x to the n minus 1, like so. I'll put two brackets there. Okay, a little over bracketed, but never mind. Okay, and then what you'll do is just expand that with distributivity. Okay, and you'll probably end up with, again, lots of powers of x that are over um, n. And then in that case, just keep going, keep substituting this in as many times as you need to do. And I'll just move this up a little bit. So keep substituting in x to the n is equal to this as many times as you do, uh, as, as you need until eventually you reduce this down to something that is um, of degree strictly, that, strictly less than n. And that's a perfectly valid maneuver in the context of this quotienting here. Okay, and you will reduce this into some other polynomial here, and that will be the polynomial which this one is going to be equivalent to. Okay, it'll be in the same coset as it. Okay, so that's why you can always reduce this down uh, to a polynomial of degree less than n, strictly less than n. Okay, so the instant this is true, this is also going to be true, and then you can use this to manipulate this into a polynomial that it will be equivalent to uh, when we quotient out by the principal ideal generated by px. Okay, and therefore we can say it will be in the coset containing that polynomial of degree uh, uh, less than n. Okay, so that's the reason that you can take any polynomial and reduce it, uh, or think of it as being equivalent to one of this form, okay, when you uh, quotient out by the principal ideal generated by p of x. Okay, so to summarize then, what you'll end up with is if you want to produce a field extension, and this will be, well, actually no, I'm careful here. Uh, if you want to produce a ring extension of a field, so you want to produce a bigger ring that contains your original field, and you want to join on an element that satisfies this polynomial at p of x here, then what you can do is generate the ring of polynomials over the field f and quotient out by the principal ideal generated by p of x here. And what you'll end up with is something of this form. You'll end up with uh, loads of cosets which can all be represented by polynomials of degree less than n. So their nice representatives are degree less than n. And the reason that all of these are in separate cosets, by the way, the reason that all of these polynomials of degree less than n are in separate cosets is because how would you take a multiple of p of x here, add it on to one of those, and get another polynomial that is of degree less than n that is different? Okay, it's the same argument that we saw before for why uh, the polynomials, uh, the constant polynomials, are always in uh, separate cosets. The same argument applies here if we've got a polynomial of degree n here. Okay, so all these polynomials that are of degree less than n are going to be in distinct cosets, and in fact, what I've shown here is that you can always take any polynomial of degree greater than or equal to n and reduce it down uh, 
into one that is uh, of degree less than n, and it will be in the same coset as that, okay? Right, and the way that you do that is just by substituting this expression for x to the power of n, which is true provided that the polynomial is equal to zero here. Okay, and that then characterizes the cosets of the ideals that you actually form here. So this characterizes your structure. And as I say, the way that you'll add these things together now is that you'll take a representative from the two cosets. So if you want to add one coset to another coset, and I might just jot this down here. So let's say we want to add r0 plus r1x plus all the way up to rn minus 1, x to the n minus 1. If we want to add that thing's coset to, let's say, another one here, s0 plus s1x plus all the way along to sn minus 1, when it's getting a little tight there, uh, x, I'll put this up here, x to the n minus 1, apologies for that. Okay, so if you want to add it to uh, this coset here, you just take a representative, a polynomial representative from each of them, might as well take the most obvious ones, the ones that the entire coset's been named after, and add them component-wise, and then you'll get uh, your new um, coset, okay? So in this case, you'll get, this is R0 plus S0, okay, as the uh, first term, plus R1 plus S1x, plus all the way along to Rn minus 1, uh, plus s n minus 1, x to the n minus 1. Okay, and this is just using addition of polynomials in the initial ring of polynomials. And then you'll take the coset that contains all of that. So you'll put a great big bar over it. Okay, and of course that will be an entry here. That will be a, another polynomial of degree less than n. And you'll be taking the coset that contains that. For multiplication, it's more complicated. If you want to multiply this one with this one, again, take two representatives. You might as well take the two most obvious representatives, multiply them together in the original polynomial ring here, and you might end up with a great big polynomial that's much bigger than, uh, you know, it, that has a degree greater than n potentially, greater than or equal to n. Then what you just have to do is reduce it down again back to a polynomial that it's equivalent to, which has degree less than n, and that coset that contains that polynomial, or, or rather which is named after that polynomial of degree less than n, that will be your answer in here. So that's how addition and multiplication are going to work, and I hope you agree that that is intuitively how you would want it to work if you were trying to construct uh, a ring extension to contain an element which settles is this polynomial. Okay, so in when we're working in with a field here, it's very, very simple. Nothing can go wrong. When we try and generalize this to a general ring, it gets a little bit more difficult. So if we now consider doing this with a more general ring here, okay, things become problematic. And let me show you which bit becomes problematic. Okay, it's this bit here. Okay, reducing some arbitrary polynomial down to a polynomial of degree uh, less than n becomes a problem. And the reason it becomes a problem is that we can't ensure that the multiplicative inverse of pn here exists. Okay, so remember we took the polynomial p of x here, and the fact that we're going to insist that this is equal to zero allows us to rearrange this and get this expression here, that xn is equal to one over pn times this. Okay, but if we're working in a ring now, it's not necessarily true that the multiplicative inverse of Pn exists anymore. Okay, and that's where we run into trouble because all of our arguments after that relied on you being able to do this. It relied on you being able to substitute this in and reducing the polynomial to an equivalent polynomial of degree less than n. Okay, and we're not going to be able to do that anymore. Okay, so everything works beautifully if you work with a monic polynomial. So if you insist that the polynomial p of x here has to be a monic polynomial where the leading coefficient is equal to 1, then we don't run into that problem because then we can just say xn is equal to get rid of that bit and it will just be the additive inverse of p0 plus the additive inverse of p1 times x plus all the way up to negative pn minus 1 x to the n minus 1. Okay, because you never need to change the coefficient in front of x to the n here. Okay, so if this is monic, then it works in exactly the same way as it did with fields. Okay, you get the same beautiful structure here. This will be what you end up with. Okay, all of the cosets will just be represented by these polynomials uh, with coefficients in the initial ring uh, of degree less than n.
Okay, however, if it's non-monic, if it's not a monic polynomial here, you it gets really, really difficult. You run into big problems, okay? And it's the, the form of this thing isn't this simple anymore. It can be horrendously complicated, and it's something which really you just have to take on a case-by-case -case basis, okay? So there's no beautiful expression that you can use in this general way. It's something that you do just have to do on a case-by-case -case basis. It's really difficult if the polynomial is non-monic, and you... Uh, I advise you to think up some examples and see for yourself why you run into trouble. And it is that you cannot necessarily anymore write x to the n is equal to a polynomial of degree less than n. And this means that you can't actually take an arbitrary polynomial and reduce it down anymore to another polynomial which is equivalent to it that is of degree less than n minus 1. So no longer will the cosets um, of uh, the quotient ring that you're constructing here actually be of this form. It'll be much more complicated. You'll have much more cosets, basically. It'll be much, much more complicated. Okay, uh, so we're not even going to touch that sort of ob uh, subject, okay? It's lovely if you do it with fields, and it's fine if you do it with rings, as long as you quotient out by a monic polynomial, uh, or the principal ideal generated by a monic polynomial. So you need to want to adjoin uh, onto your ring a um, element which satisfies a monic polynomial for it to work very nicely. Otherwise, you just have to approach it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, right. Uh, so we'll call it there for this video.